not easy. You know, we, we have to stay an extra hour for our show. Easy for Annie us. and Elston are giving it's up an hour totally of their fine. show. It's actually pretty easy for that. Love it, actually. Tony and Chris <laughs> have to come in uh, much earlier. I know uh, Tony's probably leaving on a road trip today to Los Angeles with the uh, with the Padres going up to L.A. So thank you for all being here. And it seems as though the audience appreciates it. So it's good to see you all in person this morning. I live, I live a mile away. What's, so this Chris, your microphone is call. there. You I'm go. sorry. I live a mile away. So this drive really puts me out. <laughs> I must tell you. All right. As usual, we're going to cover uh, a wide range of topics. But I thought I'd start with something that I've heard most of us discussing a little bit this week. And it's uh, a controversy uh, already early in the season for your San Diego Padres. And that is the 340 afternoon start time <laughs> that we saw in the uh, the finale to the Cubs series. Uh, some fans like it. I heard uh, I saw the reporting in the UT that the Padres management said, hey, we you know, we want it to be after school so kids can go to school and then come to the game after the game is over. Obviously, there were some shadows that were an issue. What is everybody's thoughts on 340 getaway day start times? And let's start with you today, Chris Ellis, because I felt like you didn't get called on enough no, I just last to, week. I, I just was, uh, I thought we were going uh, <laughs> counter or clockwise today. That's fine. So. Clockwise. Uh, no, I, I I just was upset that they started at 340 because we had to do a half hour show. They right. should have started <laughs> at 310. <laughs> yeah. What are they doing? Did I mean, Adam make you do that show yesterday? He of did. Course. Uh, yeah. of course. And and he put it in my contract. I only got paid by the word yesterday. <laughs> so I came up quite short. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think I can see because I'm not a really good person to ask because well, I don't I don't have family or kids or you know a, a nine to five job to deal with. But I would imagine that there's some issues. Mike Schilt you know, was asked, and he said, people, doesn't matter, so. just tell me when the game is. We'll right, show exactly. up a few hours yeah, beforehand. Right, but right. he kind of has to say that. Tony is a as a player, you had to deal with many different start times in many different cities. Did you have a preference? Did you care when the game started? No, you 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 don't love the shadows, but both sides have to to plan it. And so you you show up when you're told to. Is it the perfect time? No, I mean it's kind of like right in the middle. You can't really do anything on a three thirty game. You got to be at the yard at probably ten eleven. So kind of throws anything you want to do in the morning out. And then by the time you get done, it's probably too late to to do anything. You might be able to catch a dinner if you, you get out of the clubhouse fast enough. But I think for those who are involved, you, you just show up, you you'd, play. You'd rather see Kyle Hendricks than Dylan Cease, though, through those shadows, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> Touche. In my opinion. As, as you saw like yesterday. As you saw. Craig, any thoughts on 340? This is probably the thing I'll care the least about, but, you know. Yeah. It's shadows. I, that's the only thing is shadows directly changing. Well, and Petco Park, especially with those, the towers tend to even accentuate the the shadow oddities at Petco Park at that hour. Yeah. And so it's almost just reminds me of those playoff games when, when you know the first four or five innings are going to be weird because the shadows are going to be in play. And then which inning are you up when it's at the maximum worst? I heard Brett Boone texting into the TV broadcast yesterday going, oh, it's worst when the pitcher's dark and the hitter's dark, but the background, the backdrop is light. Yeah, that's that's depending on the individual because yeah. I always felt like light to dark was way worse way than worse? dark to light. Either way, you're not seeing the baseball yeah. that great either, in, either way. But the, I, I start to wonder watching enough of these games in that time slot if – the lights are so much better than they were because you don't see like like I watched the, the swings yesterday. I know there were some there were like a couple bad ones, but none of them looked like it was like, damn, I can't see like it didn't it didn't come off that way. So I don't know. Some of these the lights are they can do so many crazy things with these lights. I wonder, does that help these shadows not be as big? As I mean, I, I remember a number of games, Craig and I doing the pregame show at the queue when the lights would accidentally go out and. Then you had to wait about 30 minutes for them to, <laughs> to warm up and to turn on. That's right. That too. That's Nowadays, like, they can like the old high school gym. They are yeah. on and off oh instantly. Yeah, they can strobe them. They can do right. whatever they want. But back in the day, if they accidentally went off, it's delay time yeah. because those things needed 20 to 30 minutes to warm back up again and actually get light, which was miserable. Oops. Craig brought up a good point, though. And Annie, I'll ask you. The playoffs, if you ever get there, you do have to play these games, Indeed. and you don't play them at all during the season. So maybe having a couple of them to get used to them during the regular season, if you do make it to October, is not the worst thing to actually have a couple under your belt. Yeah, I think it's probably a good mentality to play in all kinds of conditions and then also get wins in those conditions and say, hey, nothing bothers us. We can do anything, rain, 
sun, shadows, any kind of start time. I think that's always a good kind of identity thing. Wasn't isn't my favorite start time, but I'm sure plenty of people loved it. And yeah, the I'm Padres sure people, loved it. Anybody complaining <laughs> about it, they shouldn't have put 40,000 people in the stands yesterday right. because I don't think the Padres went back after the game and said, ah, we gee, that didn't that. work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was you know, so completely sold out. They did give away a bobblehead. True. That was a bobblehead. But still. Yeah. So uh, it's our Padres Roundtable from 973 The Fan, presented by San Diego Roundtable Pizza. And I wanted to add a multiple choice element to the roundtable this week. And I've got a couple of them for you. But my first multiple choice question, and feel free to expand on your answers a little bit. Three Padres players who are off to really good starts this season in particular. Jackson Merrill has a 793 OPS through 15 games. Luis Camposano. 780 OPS and Jurickson Pro Far, a hard to believe 1012 OPS through three games. So, your multiple choice question, and we'll go the other way and start with Annie this time. Which of those three players do you think will finish the season with the highest OPS on base plus slugging? A good metric to who has a good offensive season. Which of those three would you gamble on at this point? Well, kind of stick with it throughout the entire year. Who'd you say? Pro Far, Pro Far, Campusano, and Merrill. Okay. I, and I left Jake out of this because I think he's in a different category. He's off to a good start as well. But I, I could make an argument for all three of those guys, and that's why I included them in my multiple choice. Who do you kind of have faith in and believe in in the hot start this season? I could pick any of them. I think I agree with you. Any of them could do it. I'm going to go with Jerks and Profar because I have – been on that, you know, he's got train. the lead right now. He's, he's got, got a little extra, lead. you know, I could easily go with campy on that. Um, but I, I just think, look, he's doing a great job. OPS over a thousand, like let's let it ride. You know, who knows? Maybe that, that switch back to the Padres uniform playing at Petco park. It's a resurgence for him. Woodsy, uh, Jackson, Merrill, Luis Camposano, Lu Jerickson pro for who do you have faith in the rest of the season? I'm, I'm going to go with campy actually. Um, I watched him yesterday and was texting with some buddies about it. We've all talked about his his approach this year. He really is getting like the game situation. Like he was letting it eat when they were up. You know, they were up big, and he's like, I don't, I don't need to shorten up here. I'm I'm gonna try to let it eat. And 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 I think he is the at bats that he's taken this year have been spectacular. Now, the only thing catching as many games as he's gonna catch is probably gonna wear you down uh, a little bit towards the end of the year. But I think I'm gonna ride with Campy on this one. I, it's not that I don't believe in Merrill. It's not that I don't believe in Profar. I've just really, really been impressed with Campy's ABs. Jerickson Profar, Craig, has a career track work record that wouldn't support this continuing at anywhere near the pace that he's on right now. Luis Camposano has some major league experience where Jackson Merrill doesn't, but he also has to deal with the fact that he's catching and the wear and tear that goes into that position usually takes a toll on players throughout the season. It does, but it'll also reduce his overall plate appearances, which could give him a chance to have higher numbers uh, when you talk about OPS specifically uh, at the end of the year. Just to back up what you said, and you know, there's a lot of people out there like Profar homers and they send me tweets. That's because you've kind you of know. been a hater a little bit. That's right. You a bit of a hater. I think that's why they're coming at you specifically. Well, here's here's the thing. His career OPS is 710, and that's over... 36, 76 plate appearances. So his career best OPS for a season is 793 when he was 25 years old. So he's not going to finish at a thousand. No, no, like, no. you know, that that's incredible what he's doing right now. I will pick Camposano. Uh, I'll pick Camposano and feel pretty good about that. Jackson Merrill, though, is playing. I mean, if this is real, yeah. then we're all going to be going crazy Amazing. the entire summer. Tony, um, it's hard for a rookie over their first 162-game season to, yeah. to keep it up at that level. Craig had mentioned, though, and we talked a little bit about it with Eno Saris on our show, the walk rate for Jackson Merrill. He now has yeah. seven walks through 15 games, through 49 plate appearances. That's that's incredible for a guy just getting started who puts the bat to the ball so well. Of those three, uh, who do you have the most faith in to finish the season the way they've started it? Probably Campy. Yeah. He, he's He's – had the right kind, a right amount of seasoning. I think he understands, and, and Woodsy alluded to it. His at bats this year um, are are mature beyond what he's shown to this point, and um, I just really believe in that kid. I think Jackson. The only issue I I can see with Jackson is a that rookie wall is going to come. It, it comes to everybody, and how does he react? You know, how quickly can he make the adjustment to the league? 
after they make the adjustment to him. How long does that take for? Because I because I keep I keep I, I hear that and I believe in it because I've seen it yeah. a million times. When do they start going? Okay, this is. Does it take a month? Does it take? It two just months? depends. The thing that Jackson, as you guys have all kind of alluded to, his plate dis is his strike zone discipline. Um, will aid that longer, right? Eventually, though, he'll go through a rut, and then it's just a battle of how fast can he stop the decline. And that is my only concern with with, with Jackson. I just think he's also mature beyond his years at yeah. the age of 20 Big time. when you watch him uh, put together a bat. Can the walks continue to be at this pace? You know, because that's going to be a big thing in terms of who's going to finish with the highest OPS. The thing about Jerickson is even when he's not swinging the bat well, he still finds his way on base. And so he I wouldn't be surprised at all if he ends up being the one out of the three, because out of those three, you know, even when he's not right. The type of point. at bat he's going to give you. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, Chris said. is sitting over in the seat of power over here where <laughs> Paul and Braden and all Brady off. Yeah. usually sit. I think he has no idea what any of these buttons do in front of him. But uh, Chris, your, your thoughts on on those trio and, and who's going to have the best season? I don't know, but you guys are coming in pretty hot. <laughs> <laughs> I have to rearrange some of this stuff. Um, you know, I, I'm going to go with the – Yeah, I, I don't even – I think he's got all the not coming in hot at all. He's the one whose microphone is – Is that good there? The yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm trying not to touch anything, this, but yeah, I can't help it. There's toy, There's toys in front of me. Um, <laughs> Whenever comes Adam. We got Adam. Adam is coming to rescue us. The last thing we need is a seventh person in this room. Yeah, I'm going to go really – I'm going to go very scientific here. Anybody who's ever followed my luck with fantasy baseball – knows that I don't often do well uh, in fantasy baseball. I have two of the three players that you were mentioning on my roster. Uh, so, so the I'm other one pick is the other good. one. <laughs> <laughs> the other one in this case is Jackson Merrill. I, I do have some faith in this guy, drawn a lot of walks. So Tony's, I mean, I'm sure he's going to have his downtime. Uh, Profar has been amazing. I want to thank Craig for saying something, you know, not, always supportive of Jerickson. I don't know anyone else on this station who would ever think to do that. Never. Except for me. Because uh, I, I cast some shade on him as well. And uh, he he's, blocked he's, our entire show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Did we, he really? Yeah. Well, we had yeah, to we go had... and get it unblocked at spring training from a couple years ago. <laughs> he's uh, yeah, he's proven us all wrong right now, and I hope that, I hope Don't that he just I hope no. he keeps it going. Obviously, uh, Campusana very tough as a catcher to do it all season. So I'll pick Jackson Merrill. Good pick. All, All right. Uh, ra- multiple choice question number two. And this one just has two choices. And I'm going to start with Craig on this one. We're switching to the pitching side. Who will end up with the better season? Again, Joe Musgrove or you Darvish? Dylan Seeks. I hey. didn't put him in there. I was waiting to say Dylan Seeks. Again, I was waiting to say I'm that. too clever for you He's guys. So clever. I, want, you guys I like to that. create a little Damn controversy it. and discussion as the moderator. So of the two veteran stalwarts of the Padres rotation, Based on just a couple of, you know, four starts each way, both have had some ups and downs. Who's going to end up with a better season of those two? Look, this is tough. And I hope that they both have very good seasons so that nobody thinks I'm a hater. Okay. But uh, so far, Joe has not had a very good season. And furthermore, his velocity is down a little bit. And even though it's just a little bit, that mile of an hour between 93 and 92, you were just talking to Eno about that this morning, how a couple of miles an hour can make all the difference in the world. Use off to the better start. I'll stick with you. Use a little older though, Tony. Um, as the as the years get going, how hard is it to to put together those good full seasons? Would you say? I mean, I know pitching is a little bit different than playing in the field every day, but yeah. age takes a toll at some point. Father time, as they say, is uh, undefeated, undefeated, except for LeBron James. Apparently. Correct. That's right. He's uh, still winning. Um, the, it's a good question. I, I, it's it's difficult, right? Because as you get older, you're not only having to stay on the same workload, but your body's changing and you're having to make adjustments to things that maybe in the past that weren't a worry. And then you may have to pull back a little bit. How do you adjust? Um, I think it'll be Joe ultimately that has the better season. The age part, I think, is is a factor in, in this. And um, when you think about you Darvish's repertoire, he, he's got a, a lot going. And, and as we saw in that start, when the breaking ball, he couldn't find the feel for it. That eliminates 
four or five pitches for him based on, you know, how he's throwing it. And so I just think with Joe and, and you know, I see the I, I look at baseball's Avon. I have that up while the game is gone. His his MPHs are down really from the first two start because in the last start, his velocity was back up in that 93 range where he normally sits at. Um, I think it'll ultimately be Joe, though. I just uh, his youth in this case, and between these two pitchers, I think will serve him serve him well. You know, Annie, uh, you obviously has a well earned reputation as a thinker out there with all of his different pitches and the tinkering that he does. Joe is actually very very similar. Doesn't quite get the the attention for it, but he is also someone who tinkers a lot and thinks a lot in between starts about you know what he's doing. They're both kind of plotters and planners when it comes to what they do on the mound. No doubt about it. And that's, there's great competition between these two, like good competition, healthy competition. And I love, you know, Joe said that he likes to follow you now because he's able to see kind of what you's doing to some of these hitters and then craft his game plan off of that. Both of these guys also really good at taking care of their bodies, yeah. always trying to get that edge. You know, you see you with these like whole sticker mechanic things, you know, attached to him in between starts, getting all these biometrics. Joe, we've all chronicled everything that he does in between starts as well. So I love that part about them, too. They're always looking to up their game. And even though they are getting older, I think that there's still a lot left in the tank there. Woodsy, you know, man, it's such a good question. Actually, I've been over here pouring over it in my head. I don't know really who to pick them. They've both had these weird starts where. They look good, dominant, and then the next inning it just kind of fell apart on both of them. And you can't land like like Tony said, can't land a breaking ball, and uh, it just gives such an advantage for the hitters because neither of them throw particularly hard. You can gas it up seemingly at will. I my question with you, Darvish, is why doesn't he do it more? Because he's got it in him, and it surprises the hell out of you when you're watching. Like it's ninety seven. Look, where's that been? And I just if I had to make if I had to make a pick, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna roll with you, Darvish. I'm gonna take you, Darvish, and uh, it's because he has so many different ways when he's right yeah. to get you out. And not that Joe's an easy at bat by any stretch of the imagination when he's locked in, but I'm gonna go with you because he throw 14 different pitches at you, Chris. I'm going to go Joe Musgrove because he is a guest on the Gwen and Chris show tomorrow. <laughs> that's very good play. At 220. <laughs> very, very that good That wasn't play. why I said Joe, but that's a good reason to say. <laughs> it's, good good play. Reason. No, it's, it's as good as any because, I mean, it's pretty hard to pick against it either guy. It, yeah, is. Well, it really is. You Darvish is wearing a Woods t-shirt, so I guess we have to go with you. <laughs> well, well, no kidding. That was some of the greatest promotion of all time. You guys should always go with you, Darvish. And did we split down the middle so that way everyone yes, is pretty much. Happy. Everyone is happy. I, okay, I, I will add, three though, three. Joe clearly had a, a rough season. You didn't have a great season last year either, but it's hard to imagine Joe Musgrove tolerating back-to-back -back seasons like he had yeah, last year. Out, that time out. Going to will himself. Yeah, Musgrove was great ten and three last there. year with a low three. That, low that, that's three fair. He'll tell he you got though. Hurt. Yes. He got now hurt. that maybe that's yes. the part of a bad yes. season, he, but he was after the he first. He was lost. Yeah, starts, he had a he great was, what a twelve start run yeah. with an ERA under mm -hmm. two was was terrific at the end of the year. But I know he feels like. That's fair. He didn't contribute as much as he wanted Let's to. Let's just That's hope fair. he has this bad of a season again this year. Yeah. Not that bad of a season. 97.3 The Fans Padres <laughs> Roundtable is presented by San Diego Roundtable Pizza. Commercial free for one hour. Let's talk. Don't a make fun of me over there. I got the control. You do. Uh, <laughs> I so can, I'll let you I go, I'll I'll let you go first in a hurry. Our next topic here, Chris. Let's talk lineup <laughs> construction. Mike Schilt went with the same first six in his order for the first 13, 12, 13 games of the season. Made a little tweak in the last couple of days, uh, but very small. Do you feel like the the lineup is where it's going to be for the most part, you know, given health considerations, or are there still big changes to come? Will Jackson Merrill make his way toward the top of the order at some point? Uh, is there other moves to be made? Will Xander Bogart stick around in the leadoff spot for most of the year, or do you feel like there's another combination that the Padres could be using that's better? I, I think once the 27 Yankees got their lineup set, they stayed with it. And, uh, you know, it's time to start comparing, guys. <laughs> and we, and we are, are, yeah, oh, yeah, we are one run behind the Dodgers in terms of runs scored for the Major League Baseball League. Now, if somebody had told you through 15 games the Dodgers would have only scored one more run than the Padres, you would have been surprised. Um, now, it's early. But uh, the Braves have only played 10 games, by the way. Yeah, sorry, 10, 10 sorry, runs sorry behind, I'm not so, yeah. looking at those kind of analytical <laughs> statistics. Don't I'm just get in the way of an argument, Ben. Yes, that doesn't support my claim, Ben. 
Uh, 80 runs so far through 15 games, albeit it's been very inconsistent. Um, but I do think Mike Schultz is going to stay with what's working, at least for the time being. Tony, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this last week, yeah. about consistency in lineup. Uh, Jackson Merrill, though, the, uh, the way he's been going, you know, they've already moved him up once. Fernando Tatis Jr., I looked it up, was six for about the first month and a half of his career. And since then, of course, he's been, you know, top three pretty much consistently since then. Is he on, is Jackson Merrill on that same trajectory? No, no, no. I mean, Jackson's going to be, he might very well be the rookie of the year when this is all said and done. But uh, we were talking two different stratospheres when we're talking Toddy and we're talking Merrill, if we're, if we're being honest. And I like the fact that Mike has held strong, at least so far, to keeping as much pressure off of, Jackson as possible. Let him be down in that 9-8 spot. He could basically be the second leadoff guy being at the bottom of the lineup. And I think that's, you know, part of what makes a, a manager good is putting guys in the right spot for them to have success. And I think aside from Jackson's ab ability on his own, Mike is putting him in good situations to go out and have success. And I think the moment you put him in the top of the lineup, that protection goes out the window because now the responsibility is on that young man to get on base and get on base often. And I just don't think it's worth it at this point in the season. Now we get to the second half of the season and he has continued to play this way. It's a conversation that may need to be had depending on what Xander's doing at that point. Let, let me broaden this out a little bit on Jackson. Merrill, go ahead. Because we're all so impressed by what we've seen. Is there, do you see the potential in Jackson Merrill to add like a power element that we haven't totally seen yet? You know, I'm some, so some, glad you are asking this some, question. Some, some players take a while to develop it, obviously. The bat to ball skills are there. Can he be a 25, 30 home run guy? Not this year, but at some point early I, in his career. I don't think we know yet. Okay. And I, I actually had this conversation with him in, in Korea um, when we were at breakfast. I said, hey, man. I hope that you continue down the path that you are on in terms of how you approach hitting because oftentimes you feel like guys get off to this kind of start and they start trying to add to their game before they're ready to add to it. And then you never see them quite reach the potential that they should. I, I think it's a, a courageous road to take in today's game to be the type of hitter that he seems to be aspiring to be. I think eventually the power will come. He'll tell you the power will come. In baseball, prior to you know this kind of new wave, that was how they scouted. They didn't look for power out of high school. They didn't even look for power out of college. They looked to see if you were driving the ball in the gaps because they knew eventually that would turn into – those doubles would turn into home runs. And so as I look at Jackson, we haven't seen him really like driving the ball in the gaps, so to speak, yet. But it's definitely in there. As you said, he's got the bat, the ball. I think the power will come, but let it come on its own. I, I know I'm focusing on Tony right here, but I want to ask this question because it's kind of been on my mind as a, a fan of your dad's growing up. Had they had the metrics back then that they did now, the things, you know, the OPS, the focus on the power and the exit velocity, your dad could have done that. We saw him, you know, if we, when he wanted to, he could do that. If yeah. he didn't, he didn't care so much about the average and putting the ball in play like he did and was the master of that. Would he have taken a different path? Could he have been, you know, 30, 25, 30 home run guy, but only hit 270, 280 in his career instead of instead of being a 330 hitter? I, I think what we have to realize is, and I'm not saying this because he's my pops, but I'm saying this because there really wasn't anybody like him in the league, even at that time. So the reason why he probably wouldn't have changed is because he would still be really the only one like himself. And it wasn't just that he did it. It was the consistency. And so teams could actually depend on it because they knew that what they were going to get from that every single year. I don't know that you can say that about anybody in the game in terms of that style. And I think that's why GMs and teams kind of shy away from it because you just can't predict that, that's going to be their norm moving forward. So, no, I don't think he would have changed all that much. Craig, uh, Jackson Merrill, kind of your your projections as to what you're going to see from him going forward. I, I want to give you, uh, to further the discussion, another first-round draft pick 
who came up and was a major leaguer at 21 playing in the outfield. Okay. And in his first full season, his slash line was 284, 362, 402. All right. Not the 24 homer power or anything like that. That player was Christian Yelich with the Miami Marlins. And he came up at age 21. And for mm, three full years, he hit four, nine, and seven home runs. And then it went to 21, 18, 36, Great 44. Exam. So that's the kind I see the size. I see the swing path. I see the discipline, the ability to command the strike zone. Like so many of these things say Christian Yelich to me, Tony, yeah, yeah. when I watch the way Jackson Merrill attacks pitchers at the plate that I say, let him be. So He's going to grow into this power. That's a great comp because of how he got to that power. As you said, it wasn't for through the first four years of his career. He was a doubles guy, singles, doubles, steal your bag, play some good defense. And then he put that, Brewer uniform on, and then all of a sudden it just took off. And that's how it's supposed to go. Like, that's a natural build. It wasn't homers out the gate, and then you see kind of this fluctuating numbers. It was pretty consistent until he started having the injury issues, and then all of a sudden, obviously that kind of changes things. Yeah. By the way, even though Christian Yelich's numbers have, have gone down the last couple of years, I everyone would be happy with a Christian uh, Yelich yeah. oh, career, yeah. right? We're, we're, we're not take Christian. Yeah, Yelich. we're yeah, going to take that, correct? Sure. I mean, that's that's that would be a phenomenal result for the Padres to get out of Jackson Merrill. We put so much Annie on prospects and dream on them, and they're going to be the greatest player of all time. You don't need that out no, of Jackson Merrill. That's a great point. You, you just you you know just keep going doing what you're doing, and he's gonna he's gonna be a very contributive player. First of all, I just got smarter listening to that conversation. So thank you. And I love that point. Like it's, it comes later. And I agree with Tony. Don't change him in the lineup right now. You leave him in the, at the bottom of the lineup. You just let him breathe there. I mean, he's shown the confidence. He's shown that I don't think things are too big for him at this level, but I do believe he's probably most likely going to run into that rookie wall at some point. And you are kind of giving him a nice cushion right now. Yeah. where He just gets to be himself still soaking in everything from the guys around him and come in and kind of just be that cherry on the top a lot, you know? And, and I think that's a great place to be in. Um, and I think it will come for him. I think the, the rest of that will come for him, but he just gets to be patient with it and breathe into this league a little bit. It's, it's a difficult adjustment. And as guys start getting to know him, he's going to have to adjust back. Woods, I'm going to give you a fresh question here. Okay. Is that okay? Like fresh I'm, I'm going to move on because I had, and I try to avoid this given <laughs> Given our role, you know, in, in, in the media, but I had a couple of fan moments the last couple of days when I was uh -oh. frustrated by the Padres base running. Yeah. Uh, Jerickson Profar making a first out at third base, going for a triple. Had Xander Bogarts get thrown out at third. I thought that was smart, actually, an attempt to get there and, and re required a, a first throw. I do feel like the Padres under Mike Schilt, aggressive base running yeah. has been a thing. Like they are trying to establish something that they didn't do last season. Are they are they trying to be too aggressive right now? And is it coming at the expense of smart decision making at times? You know the 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 play yesterday with Jerkson, it, it's the oldest adage, right? You cannot make that out there. You just can't. But I I also kind of get it. You know what I mean? I also kind of get it. It's a new it's a new era of Padres baseball. Everyone's trying to make something happen when the offense maybe can be considered floundering a little bit. I kind of like the aggressive base running. Uh, did you guys see what happened to Joe Adele the other day? He overran Not the slide, bag, yeah. they were down four to two, and Wash Ron Washington <laughs> went to the uh, media. Uh and he lit him up. I'm sure he I did. mean, he lit That's, him up. Ron don't play with that. He does not. He was like, <laughs> "This is embarrassing. It can't happen." You know, man, we've got veterans. I'm going to trust our veterans to know when they can go and when they can't. Um, and, and I like aggressive baseball. I do. And, and so far, so good with this team. So I'm not going to get too upset. Like, I didn't get upset with Kim making errors because errors happen. They picked their teammate up. I'm not going to get super, super upset with them trying to make a play. I, I just won't. You don't want to feel like you have to do something, that's though, the, that's, that's not the there. Thing. The situation, Craig, has to be there. The, the rules... The rules are the rules for a reason. You don't make the the first or third out at third base because strategically, I haven't it, seen it makes almost no sense to do so. But I haven't seen anything egregious, like super yeah. egregious, like Joe Adele down four two in the ninth. Ron said, "You want to get that bag? You got to get that bag. You cannot. Oh, you got to slide." Like he overran the bag and got yeah. tagged out, and the, the rally's yeah. over. I haven't seen anything that I would characterize as dumb. Well, yeah, you know. Only, and I would ask you, Tony, because. 
I'm I know you guys before a series, right? Would go through okay. Center fielder's got a dynamite arm. This team is great at relays. We got to be a little bit more careful. Or this left fielder, you can run on him every time. We're going to take a bag every chance we get, right? I was a little surprised the way the Padres uh, ran on Bellinger because really the Cubs, I think, are going to grade out as one of the three best defensive teams in the National League yeah. when all is said and done. They've got great players in the middle infield, all of their outfielders, you know, Suzuki and Hap and Bellinger can go get it. And Bellinger's got a whale of an arm. Yeah. They ran on him twice and they got dinged twice. Well, w- one of the run if I'm not mistaken that was a cut and relay right it was and, and so yeah you, technically you're not running you're running on that infielder that's gonna got to make a good throw and to his credit he threw a he made a dime of yeah, a I think throw, it was actually. Swanson right? it like went yeah. right Dan, it's it, Dancy it, and Nico I so mean like, it, it would have yeah, been yeah. A, it would have been inches like that ball just miss hitting Profar's shin and like ricocheting off right but I, to me uh, the one thing I'll push back on they were aggressive last year but they were not Smart. intelligent yeah uh, aggression, I guess. Um, I didn't have a problem with. It. I think you force guys in those situations. And listen, I know they scored however many runs yesterday, but it, we were just talking about them leaving opportunities. And I think in Profar's mind, is specifically the other one. You know, that was that was probably I could have done without that. But Profar's, he's thinking, I get the third here. I can make the job easier for the guy behind me. Ground ball up the middle. I'm scoring. We got ourselves a run. Now, it didn't work out the way he got thrown out. I just think I'll live with the aggression and forcing teams to make basically perfect plays um, and, and live, live with live where the chips fall at yeah. that point. I, I mean, yeah. listen, you get those scout reports. I'm sure they got them last year with Toddy. It didn't stop teams from continuing to try to run on True. him because yeah. you got to still make yeah. the play. You we can't the play. live on just your reputation – Prove it. I want to see you make the throw. Now, after you prove it once, <laughs> all right, we'll, 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 let's, we'll, 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 we'll pull back. Chris, uh, you always like to think outside of the box, usually a little different than people. I don't even know what thinking outside the box on base running really is nowadays. Is being aggressive outside the box? Is being, you know, following the rules? Is that now the is that how the weird thing that people in baseball don't do anymore? What's, what's your thoughts here? Yeah, I think you hit it, Ben. Uh, honestly, you, you read my mind. I mean, you talk about the rule is you can't make the first out at third base. Well, the rule also is with first and second and nobody out and the number nine hitter up, you bunt. I haven't seen anybody lay down a sacrifice bunt. Uh, The rules are changing. Right. And the ability to get guys in from third base is not what it once was. That's a great point. I mean, so if you get the leadoff guy to second and he doesn't try to take third when he's got a shot, you're telling me now you need two perfect situational at-bats to get him in. I don't see that many situational at bats in baseball anymore. I've seen guys, you know, slugging for the fence and it's a different game. So I don't, I, I, in a lot of ways, I don't like making the third out at third base. It's still, I'll stay with that one. Yeah. That's because you can score with a two out single, but the first, first out of third base, I think that rule has kind of gone away uh, to a certain extent. And as long as the Padres are going to try to be aggressive, they're going to have some guys thrown out. There's just no way around it. So this probably relates more to errors than it does aggressive base running but let me I'll I'll switch it a little bit because that had no consequence really yesterday because the Padres scored so many runs right but how do you balance aggressive base running or being aggressive with a team that might not have a big margin for any kind of error depending on how deep this season goes and how competitive it becomes that goes to the kind of statement you've been hearing all kind of spring and into the the scoreboard is going to tell you what you can and cannot do um and sometimes you're gonna, you're still going to risk it for some of those same things that Chris has just finished talking about. You know, when a team is going good and and you've had a bunch of situations when you've been able to get a guy in from third, less than two, then the team starts to, you know, you you you're less likely to take those risks. But when you are struggling, as the Padres had with consistency of scoring runs, there's going to be more risk taking involved. You're going to be, as Ben said, trying to make things happen. Because, you know, whether we want to believe it or not, last year is probably still rings in their minds every so often when they get in these games and somebody doesn't get a job done. And so that all kind of gets put into that same pot of, of, of equations of why you do what you do. It's our 97.3 The Fan Padres Roundtable presented commercial free by San Diego Roundtable Pizza. And now that we're a little over halfway through, I thought need something to keep 
the energy going for the second half of this program. So I've come up with what I'm calling it my Padres psychological test for each oh one of you. Okay. Right. Not just go get some pizza. You yes. can see that. Yeah. It says energy. We like like a psychological test. Keep the energy going. I think that's up, then. I'm going to turn your mic down. <laughs> yeah, right. okay. Very telling. There we go. All right. I have, I have two statements, A and B, and you get to each choose which statement sounds more true to you through 15 games. Oh, Are we ready to go? Chris, we'll just go we'll no. go clockwise around the table here. Oh boy. A. Even after 15 games, the Padres have already shown more positive signs than last season, highlighted by Monday's come from behind win, Jake Cronenworth's turnaround and a team that seems to keep improving game by game. That's statement A. Statement B. After 15 games, the Padres have shown troubling similarities to last year's team, including an inconsistent offense, shaky bullpen, and letting bad breaks cost them games. And if not for a very improbable comeback, they wouldn't even have a single series victory. Of those two statements, A or B, Chris, which one do you agree with the most? My partner, Tony Gwynn Jr., has a very, very interesting <laughs> saying that he likes, and I use it often. Sometimes both things can be true. Both, things can be true. both statements are very true. And I will tell you that that Steve. seems to apply here very well. Uh, but I'm, but honestly, I, I, you know, and I'm, I, I'm, I look at the thing half empty most of the time, you know. But I'm going to say a. Okay, I really am. I think that this they've shown some signs of doing some things differently. Uh, you didn't include the 307 batting average with runners in scoring position right now, which is I don't know we ever got to be about a hundred points higher yeah. than where they were last year. Yeah. So uh, I honestly do seem see some things that tell me it's going to be a little different this year. Uh, Chris kind of sees through me, Tony, and and the yeah, reason why it, it's because both statements are very very much true. And however you want to put on your glasses, yeah. you can make the argument for either one through 15 games this season. Yeah, now both things are definitely true, but. A, your first statement is probably more true okay. because the things that they're showing lead to winning ball games. Last year, you know, last year I don't know that they had a bullpen issue really at very many points. There were little pockets of the season where they struggled, but they didn't have those issues. Everything was centered around their offense or lack thereof. Um, and this year you just see so many signs up and down the line. Uh, and I know Manny's struggling right now, and I'm almost 100% sure, I don't know this from him, that he's not feeling 100% yet. Kim's struggling a little bit, yet they've still found a way with those two guys struggling the worst, by the way, on the team, still finding ways to win these games without their two best guys really in the middle of the lineup. So the situational hitting's been better. The runners are scoring position has been better. They just don't look like they're up there just hacking this yeah. year. It, it looks like there's a purpose behind every at-bat. Now, it don't always, you know, work out in their favor, but just from watching from the press box, they look like a, a team that has direction offensively. Craig, is the Padres bucket half full or half empty? Is well, what you I'm know, the, the baseball season is always going to reveal surprises to you along the way. We look at a team, we think this on paper, we think this over the course of six months, and, and sometimes those things will prove to be true. But every time, April is going to just wake up and surprise you every year with so many things, right? So for the Padres, to me, two things have been very surprising so far. The left-handed hitters that we, I think, all came into the season saying this is a point of concern. We're righty heavy. The lefties we're counting on. We don't know if we can count on these guys. Every single guy is playing, I would say, the best they could possibly play right now. That's fair. You know, Profar, Cronenworth, Merrill. That's a surprise. And that's way in the A bucket. And the other surprise to me is that the bullpen has been a consistent night-in, night-out source of concern. And there's been a lot of games that got added on. And I think the the real hidden story in Monday's game was that they came back from eight down because they were down four. And then it went to eight, nothing just like that. And zeros in the bullpen for that day, or at least after after that, Avila, right after that, it worked out the four, the four, four big runs could have yeah. lost that game. Eight, seven, easily. very easily. You could have lost that game. Eight, seven. So they are they are hunting for another right-handed, reliable option out of that bullpen. De Los Santos is starting to establish himself, yep. but the next guy behind that 
it's wide open and it's been quite scary. And I think that's that's where the B side is. You're actually leading toward a next topic, but I wanted Woods and Annie to be able to sound off on their uh, their psychological test results. Last year was hard because of the hype. And you look at the first five, the bit with the big four, you know, certainly, and it just you'd watch these games and be like, I don't understand why we're not scoring runs because you you line them all up. You're like, this doesn't make any sense in my brain. And you see what the Dodgers are doing with their the top of their order mashing, you know, and that's the bottom of their order, not mashing. Mm -hmm. You know, the bottom of our order has carried us, really. Yeah. I mean, they really yeah. have. And Dodgers would kill for the bottom of the Padres order right now. You, we switch. And <laughs> they don't need anything. Else. They don't need anything else. <laughs> and so I think la I, I'm going to go with A because yeah. of last year, the frustration of like banging your head in the wall, like, how do you not score runs with this team? It just made you insane. Now when you score runs, like, oh, hell yeah. Look, at can, Merrill's contributing. Tyler Wade contributed early. Um, you know, that's fun. I mean, that's fun to me. And sure, I miss Juan Soto. Absolutely, I miss Juan Soto. But holy smokes, man, like, what we've been able to do so far, tread water as we have with what we have, has been pretty solid. I'm going to go A, and I'm I'm pretty much a B guy, but I'm an A. I'm an A on this. All one. right, everybody's been pretty optimistic. Annie, are you ready to throw a bucket of cold water on everything? You no, know, I'm, I'm not going to. <laughs> These balls. <laughs> <laughs> 15 games in, I, there's no way I'm not going A. It's the, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt because of the messaging that they've been talking about, because of the intent that they've come into the season with and the fact they were embarrassed by last year, um, all of that. I would like to see this pattern of win one, lose one, win one, lose yeah. one, go away. I think they need to get on a little bit of a streak or you know, put a few together um, for them to kind of take it off to the next level. But we've already seen some different things this year. We've seen better ABs. We've seen multi-run innings. We've seen them come back. And the one thing that I will give you is that Jake Cronenworth having that ball go through his glove in Korea and then that not being the end of the season for him. You can't tell me when it, when that happened and we actually saw the replay. Everybody's like, oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Just the fact that now he's one of your most productive hitters and, uh, uh, you know, obviously doing so well. I think that is a, a good omen for this. Team uh, right I think now. we've established that if you are a somewhat optimistic person, there's no reason not to maintain at least some of that optimism about the Padres going forward. All right, I do want to talk about the bullpen. Kind of a, a two-part question. And Annie, why don't we just go right back to you and we'll go around again. Which non-Robert Suarez reliever do you trust the most right now to pitch a scoreless inning? If you had to, if Mike Schill had to go with someone in the seventh or eighth Oof. to protect a one-run lead, who's the guy you trust the most? And sub-question, is it time to make at least one change to call down to AAA and bring up a Jeremiah Estrada, uh, maybe send someone like Johnny Brito down. Would you make a move at this point in the season? So I was looking yesterday thinking Matsui, De Los Santos, and Peralta. It's it's a good combo, I think. Um, I'm going to go scoreless inning. I'm going to go Matsui right yeah. now. I'm going to go Matsui. You know, he did quick inning like, at least. Quick inning. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could pick any of those. Um, he Yeah, he does in like four pitches. Everybody loves it, right? Efficient guy. So, um, and, and as far as a change, you know, I was I was a little iffy on this yesterday. I felt like you got to give it a little bit more time to work. But at this point, I do think that by, if they get through Los Angeles and things are not going as planned in this bullpen, I think by next week you make a change and you do bring up someone else or you may be part ways with a colic or some, someone like that that you're willing to let go of. I think, Chris, did you see my Matsui stat that he, over his last three outings, his last 12 pitches has resulted in eight outs that is as efficient as you can possibly get out of a drill style. That's 12, what you want to do with that. 12 pitches, eight outs. Somewhere, Randy, out. somewhere Randy Jones is uh, <laughs> smiling ear to ear. Yeah, 100%. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I'd go with Matt Suey right now. I feel the best with him. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm liking De Los Santos, too, a little yep. bit. Um, they need somebody to step up from the right side. Uh, you know, in case that eighth inning is filled with three big right-handed hitters. I, I don't know that I want to have Matsui always have to get those guys out in the eighth inning. Sometimes I think you can play matchup. And they're looking for a right-handed guy in front of Suarez. So those are the two guys. Don't sleep on Wandy Peralta, yeah, though. I, I, was gonna I, say I don't Wandy. sleep on him because other than those two hit batters against the Cardinals, I mean, he's been pretty tough. He's you got know, the he's one thing that job. a lot of those guys doesn't. Uh, ton of experience and experience in big games on a big stage. Yeah. yeah, you know, and I was thinking about it. If we're going to send Graham Pauly down to AAA to get ABs and get work in, and we've 
you know, they 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 envision Johnny Brito as a starter. Maybe it is time for Jeremiah Estrada, a guy that's going to come in out of the bullpen late, get Brito, get Brito down. You need you, you need somebody that's going to eat those innings. You know what I mean? Like, can I you, ask you why? Why Estrada? He's been throwing just the bat. He's been throwing the bat. Yeah, his and, velo, and he's been throwing really well down there. So, I mean, is there somebody else? In that, there isn't. There's there Vasquez, isn't, there's why, Jacob. Um, I, I think part of the issue, the reason why those guys went down, coming out of the bullpen, what you can't do is walk guys. Yeah. And all of those Vasquez to, to Estrada, when they were on the cusp there, that's what they did. Walk was they, they walk guys. And so, although I don't think – it's kind of sorted itself out at the big league level. I think the reason why those guys are down there is to prove that they can come into a game and not put a guy on. And, and if they do find a way out of it and out. at the big league level, you know, when you walk it, it's we've seen it already. We've seen it work for us. We've seen it go against when you walk guys yeah. at this level, it, you're dead. They, yeah. They come, dead. They, they come around the school, you know, and, and, and I, I guess I'm just looking at it from the perspective of, how many innings eaters do you need? You've got Avila kind of in that role. Um, who was fine? I don't think I they mean, want Burrito to be an innings I don't, eater. I don't think so either. I, but he's not a high leverage guy. He either. can't be high leverage so right now. So what is he? I, I, the my issue with what when I see Burrito is I don't know that his breaking ball is good enough at the big league level yet. It's like, probably knee jerk for me to totally say. Well, it, it's his fastball changeup is plus. You know they're plus pitches, but. The breaking ball, he he has to use it. Yeah, and it's just I don't think it's major league ready yet. I don't so. know how good El, how great El Paso. Yeah, would that's be the other thing. Either, that's so. the other thing. You're gonna send him to El Paso. I don't know if that's like yeah. the best play. Send all good pitchers to double A. To double A. Like, Every one of them. Like, hey, let's let's switch up the bullpen. But it's always that you got to answer with that question. Well, who else do we put in there? Right. Who does come up and and are they ready? Greg, let me add with your answer. Can the Padres continue to hold Stephen Kolek? <sighs> For well, the whole year, it, it's not been bad. Obviously, the Grand Slam was bad, but you, you give him up if you if you send, if you send him down, you give him up. And he, he's shown he's shown the ability to be on the big league level, but can you hide him the entire year? No, on a contender, no. Then, he then, has you, should to get, then you should just make that decision like, sooner yeah, rather. Than he later. has to be a a successful part of the bullpen to stay here because we're contending. I mean, you and I were covering teams with Corey DeHaan and Shane Victorino, who turned out to be a great player. But like, slow like, down. You know, <laughs> know, but, name and names. But, but I mean, just he saying, wasn't them. Like, no, every year there would be one or two rule five guys on the Padres because you're not content. I've, you've heard me say this a million times. If you've got a rule five guy, are you really contending? If you've got two, you're not. You know, and for Kolek to stay here, he's got to be good. Now, Annie and I talked about this yesterday a lot on the show, and I just look at his body of work. Kolek's? He, Kolek's. He's 27 years old. So when you're dreaming on Stephen Kolek, understand, he's he's already gone through his mid-20s. Now, in the minor leagues, he had a four and a half ERA for a lot of innings. Like, he doesn't strike out a batter in an inning. His walk rate historically is 3.7 per nine innings, which is Blake Snell territory. Like it's in that range of walking a lot of guys. So I don't, I I'm fine with this. I understand Ruben sees something right in that sinker, in that sweeper. They expect him to be good against right-handed batters. They need someone like that. They're hoping Stephen Kolick will be that player. All I would ask as a fan is don't be precious about it because he's a 27 year old kid he, he's not 21 and someone i'm going to dream on as the future closer of this team all right uh we got a few minutes left uh one of the biggest topics in baseball early in the season i know every show has addressed it this week the pitching injuries early in the year and we got into some heated discussions already and and chris i know you've got heated huh well i, I mean not just passionate. don't get bad passionate it. passionate okay, um, okay. Right. fine oh. You know, responding to I, I thought I thought the players union when they sent out a statement basically going, yeah, these two seconds that they cut off when bat when there's someone on base, which is only, you know, part of the game anyway, that that could somehow have created a rash of pitching injuries in the last three weeks, I thought was ridiculous to me. The 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 pitching injuries are an absolute important topic that needs to be studied and addressed by major league baseball but did you think it was equally ridiculous what major league baseball then put out it it wasn't i mean the, the response was kind of 
ill thought out and not well backed oh, so up. You did, yeah, you, you did think it was ridiculous, yeah, then. Okay. but you know, it's the velocity <laughs> to me is is really the answer. It's been the answer for the last few years. The human body, Chris, is not designed to throw as fast as these guys are throwing, and the ligaments are what are suffering. And it's just going to continue to happen until there's some medical advancement that hasn't been invented yet, other than repairing them once they're broken. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they're going to stop this. Um, yeah, and I don't either. Uh, Mike McCurdy was my pitching coach uh, in high school, and he was the one who first pointed out to me that we don't walk around with our arms up in the air like this because it's una unnatural. unnatural. It's unnatural is what we're getting at. Yeah. And, and not very clearly, sorry to anybody else in the room, but it's it's an unnatural movement to throw overhand was my point. And so that's that's something I learned a long, long time ago. And I think that it all starts with just the way baseball is right now. I don't think there's too many, you know, Randy Jones type young men that are being groomed for the major leagues anymore. If you don't throw 95 I don't even know that you even get a look anymore at the major league level. So what does that tell you? If you're a young kid, you better learn how to throw 95 some way, somehow, if you want to make it to professional baseball as a pitcher. The spin rate is off the charts as well. And I, I, until you change those two fundamental issues, I think arm injuries are going to continue and continue to, to be a big issue. But – I don't think you're going to ever change those fundamental issues because people want to get to the major leagues. What's baseball going to do? Put a uh, speed you know, limit. Put a governor yeah. on the yeah, on how fast ball. you can throw. Anything above ball. 95 is automatically a ball. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you put a governor on the speed. That's that's my thinking. But I mean, I don't have any medical proof to back any of that up. I just know that back in the day when they threw hundreds and hundreds of innings more, they didn't throw this hard and they didn't get hurt this off tony you know player motivations i know they all want to win but they want to get, get paid. paid yeah and True. and throwing hard get some paid and yep. by the way in baseball unlike some other sports salaries are guaranteed so once they get that contract the money's coming in the right. incentive is to throw as hard as you can as long as you can which is why the players association put that letter out because those pet contracts are guaranteed and they want to keep it that way it's all kind of plays into it i've been saying this for a long time uh, I, I believe in a conversation I had with John Smoltz. He, he, he said it publicly at this point. When you are you, you get in your vehicle, you don't redline your vehicle. You don't. I do. well, yeah. It doesn't last long. <laughs> it doesn't. And, and if you do, you, you, your car is not going to last as long. And I view it the same way. It's, it's the same way offensively, right? The onus is on the teams to reward what they're looking for. What they're looking for is velocity. So guess what everybody else is going to do? They're going to try to get to that velocity. It's no different than the offensive end and homers and things of that nature. If the moment teams started rewarding guys for throwing hard and not necessarily pitching is when we've kind of crawled into this problem that we're in. And until they start to reward it differently, it's not going to change. And you could have a clock. You can have no clock. It's not going to matter. Guys are still – injuries were here before they were doing that, by the way. Like before guys were redlining, injuries were still happening. Now they're happening much more frequently, and it's hard not to believe that it has something to do with that. Craig, are we seeing a change? I, I saw Jordan Montgomery fired Scott Boris, yeah. and <laughs> you know, and the, the market may be correcting on some pitchers. Well, I, I know we're close to the very end of this, so I would just say to injuries, I would suggest everyone go find Justin Verlander's comments, uh, which we played on the yeah. show a couple of days ago. I was about four minutes, but he really went through all of the multitude of reasons. It started with the ball becoming a happy Fix fun ball. the baseball. So – you know, the baseball is one of the places you could go to look for this. But here's the other thing. Will Carroll was on our show yesterday talking about a high school pitcher throwing 100 miles an hour Ooh. when that ligament doesn't mature for another 10 years. So we're a long way away from fixing this. Start. And, and that's the thing is it trickles down to the lower levels. Go ahead. What go ahead. Co what coach is going to be like, hey, ease off? Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? It just doesn't happen. Your point is great, though. Control what you can control. The fix, ball, the fix the baseball. Fix the ball. At least start with that. Any you, last thoughts, 30 I, seconds? I think they should go to the guys like Verlander and the, you know, excellent pitchers and say, what do we need to do? How can, like, form a committee, make it work instead of just back Why and forth, wouldn't back you? and forth. Why pitching in his 40s? Yeah, I yes. know. Like, it's listen to him. Right. Like get Nolan. Like, get all these dudes who pitch long. Yeah. Pick their brains. 
is silly to me. Yeah, I agree. Everybody, great content again. Uh, we will see you again next Thursday uh, for our next Padres commercial free roundtable presented by San Diego Roundtable Pizza for Annie Halbrun, Stephen Woods, Craig Elston, Tony Gwynn Jr., and Chris Ello. I'm Ben Higgins. Have a great rest of your day from all of us here at San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. So long, everybody. Go ahead.